All right, hello everyone. Uh, I've got one little thing that I want to add uh, to our lectures about evolution and natural selection. And just to um, develop and explain Darwin's thinking and, and how he put this all together. Um, I like to do this. This is something that um, actually, I think Ernst Meyer, a famous biologist, kind of came up with. Um, uh, some simple arguments and inferences that Darwin used to help explain this idea of natural selection. And I like this because it's very organized, it's very logical, and uh, it helps to kind of, you know, just put this straight in your brain. And so um, I just want to go through this real quick. And so there's a few things that Darwin points out in his books and in all his writings um, that help to support this idea of natural selection. And the first thing I want to talk about is this idea of artificial selection. Not natural selection, but artificial selection. And, you know, artificial selection is when humans purposely breed two organisms to enhance the traits that they want. Okay? And, of course, humans have been doing this for, uh, a, a, you know, millennia, right? As long as humans have been around. And Darwin, I think, was kind of big into pigeon breeding, and so, you know, you breed different pigeons to get different characteristics. But anyone um, is familiar with the things that, that farmers and people do to artificially select for traits that they want in certain organisms. So, for example, um, you, you're familiar with most of these vegetables, kale and Brussels sprouts, cabbage broccoli, kohlrabi, those are all very different um, vegetables, but they're actually all the same species. They all are different forms of wild mustard. And just by breeding together individual plants that, that had those traits that humans wanted, you know, like a big flower, and you just keep picking the ones with the biggest flowers and you keep artificially or selectively breeding those, you can end up with plants that produce broccoli, you know, which is a big heavy flower. Whereas other people want to enhance, say, the, the leaves. And so you take the offspring that have the biggest leaves and you breed them together. And then you take their offspring that have the biggest leaves and you artificially select for certain traits, you can get very different organisms. And so that's, this is an example of that. Here's another example, right? Um, you're familiar with different breeds of dogs. Well, how did we get those? We started with, uh, you know, wolves and domesticated them. And then, you know, we said, well, we want a dog that likes to retrieve and likes water. And so we take the puppies that are best at that and we breed them. And then we take their puppies that are best at retrieving and, and love water. And you just keep doing that. You keep selecting for those traits and you can end up with a Labrador Retriever. Or you can say, no, I want a dog that's got a really good nose and it's a real friendly dog. And you can select those puppies that have those traits and keep breeding those together. And you get the Springer Spaniel. And then, and then Josie, the one in the middle, I don't know what dog she is. I don't know what you would select for. A very aggressive, very small lap dog, something like that. Anyway, you know that this is how we get breeds of dogs. So Darwin's argument is, look, we know that by you know purposely selecting for traits and only letting those organisms with those traits breed, we can get very different organisms in just a few generations. And so that shows that by selecting for certain traits, organisms can change. And you can do it in very short time with artificial selection. And so it's very possible to get, it's possible to get very different organisms from the same common ancestor just by selecting for certain traits. Here, we're doing it artificially. And so if you can artificially select traits and get very different descendants in a very short time, then you can also naturally select for traits and get very different descendants. It just takes longer. And so here you've got a couple of vertebrates that have a common ancestor. You've got a fish and a human, right? And so by nature selecting for different traits over a very long time, 
you can get very different organisms just like you can do with artificial selection. And so, you know, that's one of Darwin's, uh, you know, just examples that he used to support his, his arguments. And then, again, we have several arguments and observations that Darwin made, and he put them all together to come up with this idea of natural selection. And so this is, again, this is, I think, Ernst Meyer kind of organized them in this way. But let's start with the first observation. All species over-reproduce. And so stop and think about that for a second. Um, if you're a biologist, and if you're a naturalist like Darwin was, and you're looking at all kinds of different organisms all over the world, you realize all species produce way more offspring than they can expect to survive. All species over-reproduce. And so here's an example. You know, moths releasing spores. Every one of those tiny, tiny little spores is a potential offspring. An ear of corn, every kernel is a seed. Every kernel is a potential offspring. And so on one ear, you have a ridiculous number of potential offspring, and you've got several ears on one plant. There's no way an organism can expect all of those to survive. This is a, a fish called a moon eye. And, um, and so all these little, little spheres, all these little balls that you see here, the white ones, this is one ovary, right? And so this female has got a ridiculous number of eggs, and that's only one ovary. There's a whole other ovary with just as many eggs. Some of these silver carp that we have in Kentucky Lake can have a million eggs. There's no way that you can expect all those offspring to survive. And this is not just cherry picking. Think about all the living things that you know. They're all like that. You say, well, what about humans or what about elephants that, you know, the slow, very, that, that don't have many offspring? If you actually do the math, you see that if all the offspring of an elephant or all the offspring of a typical human survived and reproduced, that it would only take a few generations for the planet to be covered up in elephants or covered up in humans. So it's actually true that there's no way that every offspring can survive and reproduce. There's just too many of them. And so Darwin said, all right, given that, but here's another thing that Darwin observed. Natural populations remain, remain relatively constant in size. You don't see boom and bust, or you don't see exponential population growth in most populations, right? So if you're producing so many offspring, and each of those offspring then are producing so many offspring, you would expect the population to grow exponentially, and it would just get bigger faster. There are certain situations where you've got a new organism in a new environment. You know, you put bacteria in an empty test tube and it will grow exponentially, but eventually it will stop growing exponentially. You learn about that in ecology, right? But if you look at, in general, most populations, you don't see this exponential growth. You see that although you're producing tons of offspring, the population stays about the same size. And so this is, again, this is what exponential growth looks like, is that over time the population gets bigger, but in fact it gets bigger faster. The rate of increase goes up. That's exponential growth. That's what you would expect if all these offspring survived and reproduced. But it doesn't happen that way. They don't grow exponentially in, out in, in nature. <coughs> Excuse me. The third thing that Darwin pointed out is that resources are limited. And that's just, <coughs> uh, you know, I hate the word common sense, but that's just common sense. Right? There's a finite planet, there's finite space, there's finite water, there's finite light, there's finite nutrients. Every organism lives in a world of not necessarily scarcity, but limited resources. Uh, you know, here in the uh, United States, we act like there are unlimited resources and we just, you know, we keep burning fossil fuel and, and keep trying to have our economy grow as if there aren't resor uh, limited resources, but there are. And we have to acknowledge that. And in nature, it's very clear that there's only so much space. There's only so many nutrients. There's only so much water. The resources are limited. <clears throat> 
And so from those observations, Darwin drew a conclusion or an inference. He said, look, all organisms over-reproduce, but the populations remain stable and resources are limited. And so what you can infer from that is that only some of the organisms get those limited resources and survive. Since populations don't grow exponentially, most organisms that are born die before they can reproduce. That's what the significance of that fact. You've got so many babies born, most of them are going to die. There's only limited resources, so only, you know, some of the organisms that are able to get the limited resource are the ones that are going to survive, and the rest of the organisms are the ones that are going to die. And so these are just things that, that, you know, if you study biology for five minutes, you're like, well, yeah, that all makes sense. Another thing Darwin pointed out, members of a population often vary in their traits. There's variability. And again, we know this. You, you look at any population, you can see there's differences among individuals, right? And sometimes you have to be, you know, maybe an expert, right? Maybe you can look at all the blades of grass in a lawn and they all look the same. They all look the same to me, right? But if you were a grass person, you'd be like, oh, no, look, you can see there's differences among these blades of grass. You look at these ladybugs. And some people might say, well, they all look the same to me. But you can clearly see there's variability here. There's different sizes. There's different spot patterns. There's, there's variability. And if you study biology for five minutes, you see that that's true, right? You see that there's variability within populations and between populations you know your mama always told you that you were special well you are right there's there's you know but everybody's special because everybody's different and you can see this variability you know with your own eyes and of course again darwin studied living things and so that's where he he observed it with his own eyes but these days you know we look at the DNA. We look at the ultimate source of all that variability. And when you look at the DNA, it's a ridiculous amount of variability. It's, it's an unimaginable amount. And, and again, every organism has unique DNA. And we can see that now. Of course, Darwin couldn't, but we can. And so again, in biology, variation is common. It's the rule. Now, Darwin also said, much of this variation is heritable. That these traits that vary among individuals get passed on to their offspring. And so it's not random who gets what trait. You get your traits from your parents. Again, this goes back to you know, this idea of artificial selection and breeding things. And, and you, know, you realize that, right? That traits get passed on to their offspring. Now again, put it in context. Darwin didn't know anything about DNA. Didn't know anything about cells. Right? This, none of this was figured out yet, right? Um, Mendel, at the same time Darwin was publishing this, Mendel was over in Austria, and he was doing these experiments with pea plants, and he was kind of figuring out those rules, right? Like how, you know, that the, there are rules to how these traits get passed on. And sometimes a trait will skip a generation, but he was figuring out sort of how these things happen. But Darwin never heard of him. It wasn't until 50 years later, you know, in the early 20th century, when people started to put Darwin and Mendel together and realize, oh, these two things complement each other real well. So Darwin, and Darwin, you know, acknowledges this. He's like, look, I don't understand how traits get passed from parents to offspring, but I know it happens. And of course, again, um, if you look, you can see, you know, so here's Sophia when she was much younger. Oh my gosh, look at, look at how young Sophia is there. Look how young Susan and I are there for that matter. Um, but, you know, you can clearly see that uh, Sophie has characteristics of both of us, right? Parents pass on traits to their offspring. Um, she gets a lot more, you know, she looks a lot more like her mom, thank God, right? But she has my eyes. And so, again, taking, given these facts, Darwin drew a conclusion or an inference. So there's lots of variability in organisms, and each generation, only a few organisms were, will survive. So survival is not random. So you remember earlier we said, look, 
Um, most organisms are going to die before they reproduce. There's only certain, uh, there's only a finite amount of resources. So only some get the resources. There's lots of variability. It's not random who gets the resources and survives. It's those that are best suited. Those who have the traits that are best for the environment they're in will have a better chance of getting the limited resources and a better chance of surviving and a better chance of reproducing. But then again, those traits are heritable. And so the survivors will pass on the very traits that gave them an advantage. Um, so we, we make this point because um, one argument that sometimes people who, who are unfamiliar with evolution and natural selection, they'll often make the argument that you know, how can, how can you get uh, all these species from a random process? That, that, you know, there's no way you could get such order from random things. And it just doesn't make any sense. But that doesn't make any sense, because, but that's not how it works, right? Um, there are random aspects to evolution, just like there are random aspects to life, right? The, the life is stochastic. There are some unpredictable things. Mutations are random, all right? And so the, the source of these new traits is random changes in the DNA. But survival is not random. Reproduction is not random. It's those who are best suited for their environment are more likely to survive and reproduce. And so the result of natural selection and the evolution of all these species that we see, that's not due to a random process. It is decidedly unrandom. And so again, you see all these different ladybugs and only some of them are going to get resources and survive and reproduce. Is it random which ones will survive? No. Some are better suited to the environment. Is there an aspect of randomness? There's an aspect of randomness to everything. But, but the complete process is not random. Some are born better suited to their environment. Again, mutations that create new, new traits are random, but which organisms survive and reproduce is not random. And so again, this goes back to this idea we talked about earlier, differential survival and reproduction. All are not equal. All do not survive equally. All do not reproduce equally. That's the differential part. And we talk about survival plus reproduction. That's the two main components of, that's two components of fitness, right? Just being able to survive doesn't do any good if you don't pass those traits on. And so being able to survive and reproduce, that is what increases your fitness. And so from all these arguments, Darwin made some final conclusions. Over a long time, favorable traits will accumulate. And you can get very different organisms over time. And so because survival and reproduction is not random, it's those favorable traits that are more likely to stick around and the maladaptive traits are going to disappear. And so over time, you can get organisms that change just like you do when you have artificial breeding and artificial selection. When you purposely pick traits and select those organisms with those traits, you can get very different breeds of dogs or very different plants or very different chickens or whatever. If it's natural, if it's just whoever is best born best suited, and it's nature that is selecting, again, they're not really selecting, but if it's just natural, which traits are best suited, and those traits keep getting selected for, the same thing. You can get a very different organism. It just takes a lot longer. And so again, back to the classic giraffe uh, you know, example. Early giraffes had variation in their necks. Some had short necks, some had necks that were a little longer, some had medium necks. Because of the environment, because the food was up high, those that had longer necks were more likely to get the limited resources, were more likely to survive, and more likely to reproduce. And so over a long time, all the 
short neck and medium neck giraffes died off and all that you're left with is long necks. And so although you had variation in neck and shorter necks early, over a long time, you have this one trait that's very enhanced. And again, Lamarck was close but didn't quite get it. And, and there are some, again, there are some traits that are Lamarckian. So, you know, Lamarck, Lamarck is kind of like sometimes is the, you know, the butt of the joke or the whipping boy. And it's not fair um, because he had some good ideas and some of his ideas panned out. But in general, he was wrong. His idea of acquired characteristics was wrong. There are two reasons. He, he thought that individuals would change over their lifetime and then pass on those changes. And so they would acquire a characteristic, like they would stretch their neck, and then their offspring would be born with a longer neck. That's not how genetics works. That's not how it works. And so he was wrong. Another way that Lamarck was wrong is that this would mean that individuals in, evolve. You know, the individuals change over their life. So individuals are the unit of evolution, and that's not true. Individuals don't evolve, populations do. And so the average neck length in the population got longer over time. But individuals changing over time, that is not how evolution occurs. And it's a subtle difference, but a not so subtle difference, but it's something that we'll keep talking about. That the unit of evolution is the population. So. You know, individuals can change, right? You can work out and get stronger, you can get a tattoo, whatever, but you don't pass those changes on, and that's why Lamarck was wrong. But the population as a whole, on average, can change. As some traits, you know, as one trait becomes more frequent, one trait becomes less frequent in the population. So that's why we say individuals don't evolve, populations do. And so an individual is either born well adapted or not. They don't change to suit their environment. And that's a mistake a lot of people make. It's somehow the, the organism senses that they need to change and then they can pass. You know, an organism can sense, oh, I need to change. I need to, to modify, you know, whatever. I need to, to get bigger. But they, if they can't pass that trait on, then that can't be selected for. Favorable traits accumulate in populations over time. That's why we say populations evolve. And so again, just to think about this, natural selection acts like a sieve. It favors individuals with characteristics that are favorable to a particular environment at a particular time. And that's the only thing that's important. It has no goals or objectives, right? We do see over a long time that organisms get bigger and they have more cells and they get more complex sort, you know, you can kind of argue that, but that's just because favorable traits, that's just because the accumulation of traits over time, um, you know, it's like interest in a bank or something. It's like, it's just, you know, over time things build up, but it's not because evolution and natural selection have a goal to make better organisms, right? It's just who is best adapted for this environment at this time. The better adapted tend to leave more offspring, and they're, those offspring are also well adapted, right? But it completely matters what kind of environment you're in. And so you can get some pretty incredible results, right? And, and biology is fascinating. I wouldn't be here if I didn't think biology is fascinating. And this, this uh, uh, mantis is very well camouflaged in this environment. You know, a woodpecker very well suited for his environment, right? Can stand on the side of a tree and it's got this big heavy beak with a big heavy skull. It can poke holes in a tree. That's pretty well adapted for where it lives. But what if the environment changes? That's the thing, is you're seeing that organism that's, you know, seems to be designed for that tree or designed for that leaf litter or whatever. And so some people think, oh, there must be a God because, you know, a God would design it right? You know, and humans think like that, right? If we see something that's very well built, or, you know, a, a well-built car or well-built house, you know, a human designed and built that. And so we think everything must be like that. And so it's natural to think that. But this is actually, a, you know, a different way of thinking that, you know, we can't talk about supernatural and science. And you say, well, there's another way that you can get something, right? If everything that was poorly adapted disappeared, then the only thing left would be those things that are well adapted 
to that environment at that time. But if the environment changes, then that organism is no longer well adapted, right? And so if the plants changed, and so the leaf litter changed, then this organism would no longer be well camouflaged. If predators started using scent instead of sight, you know, if other, you know, there are all these other organisms in the community that, that live with this organism, and they're all evolving, and the environment's constantly changing. And so, although, you know, this organism is well suited today, its offspring, or, you know, if the environment changes, then its offspring won't be well suited, and other offspring will be well suited. And there's no goal, it's just who's well suited at that time. You know, if the forests has softer bark than other organisms might might have a, an advantage. If I took this organism and I threw it in a lake, would it be doing very well? No, right? And so it's not that these things were designed by someone to be perfect for this environment. It's just like everything that wasn't well designed for the environment died off and you're left with things that are well suited to their environment. This is another way to explain what we see but it doesn't rely upon supernatural explanations. If I threw this, you know, if these birds all got thrown into a lake, they would all die. They would not do well. But there might be one that's a good swimmer and, and it might have different characteristics. But if the environment changes, then the, you know, selective pressure changes. And so there's no goal. They're not sensing, oh, this is what I need to do to be perfect for this environment. They're either born that way or not born that way. And if the environment changes, then there's a different set of characteristics. All organisms are living in environments that are always changing, both the biotic and the abiotic. You know, the planet is heating up, right? The abiotic, so the temperature is getting much greater and that's gonna influence rain and everything. And so that environment's changing. All these organisms are all evolving and all trying to survive and all trying to get an edge. So they're constantly changing. Those that are maladapted are constantly being eliminated. You know, and so there's no direction. It's just what works today in this environment. Over long periods of time, you can see that some are more successful in this environment and others aren't. Species go extinct, new species evolve. But eventually the planet and the area, the environment's gonna change enough that that new species is gonna go extinct and another species is gonna evolve. And that's the history of the earth. That's what we observe directly. That's what the fossil record tells us. That's, you know, pretty much, that's how we think it happens, right? So anyway, just a little bit more about what Darwin thought and how Darwin put this all together. Um, kind of repeating a lot of the things we already said, and that's fine, you know, just kind of talking about things in a different angle. Maybe hopefully it'll click with you. Um, anyway, so um, that's all I've got here. Let me know if you got any questions, and I'll see you later. See ya.